Amen. So in Deuteronomy chapter 10, uh, we'll get right into it here. It says in verse 1, At that time the Lord said unto me, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and come up unto me into the mount, and make thee an ark of wood. And I will write on the tables the words that were in the first tables, which thou breakest, and thou shalt put them in the ark. And I made an ark of shittim wood, and hewed two tables of stone like unto the first, and went up into the mount, <coughs> having the two tables in mine hand. So, of course, you know, we recall, you recall the first instance of the tables being made. He went up into there, yeah, same thing. Goes up in the mount, he writes them. Uh, God writes with the finger of God, you know, the, into the tables, brings the Ten Commandments come back down. And we all know the story. They find uh, the children of Israel worshiping the golden calf. And then, you know, Moses, in his anger, you know, breaks all the commandments. He threw, <laughs> it's kind of a dumb joke. He broke all the commandments at once. He's the biggest sinner, right? So uh, I didn't even mean to make that stupid joke. <laughs> what I meant to say is he, break, broke all, he broke both commandments at once. So he throws them down and breaks them in his anger, in his fury. And of course, then he you know, breaks the calf. He melts it down. He casts the, water, the, the, go, the dust of the gold under the water. He makes them to drink it. And now, you know, God's saying, well, let's try it again. And, you know, that's really a theme that in, throughout all the Bible that you see God trying again, trying again, trying again. Man's messing it up. He tries again. Man messes this up. He tries again just over and over and over. <coughs> and this is another instance of it. Now, I tried to, I tried to kind of figure this, and, and you know, I'm, I'm not 100% sure about this, but to the best of my recollection, and, and when, I, when I was studying and reading this, I could not see, uh, in the first instance, the first time he told them to make uh, the, the tables of stone, to take them up into the mount, he did have them make an ark, I don't, I don't think. I, I probably, you know, I, I probably shouldn't even say that because I think I'm, I'm probably wrong about that. But we know for sure that, that God specifically is saying this time, look, and you're going to put this in the ark. And really, what we see here is the importance of the ark. You know, it wasn't just that these two tables of stone could be set anywhere. They had to be put somewhere very specific. And he told them to put them in the ark. And really, what this does is it shows us a couple of things. One, you know, the tablets in, them, in and of themselves show us something very important. The tablets, you know, of course, are the Ten Commandments. You know, those are the Ten Commandments that God gave to us. And of course, that's not the whole law, but those are, you know, the main commandments. And, uh, you know, what those show us is that God is holy in his nature, that God is a holy God, that God is a just God, that God is a righteous God. And if you would, let's turn back to, uh, let's turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6. <clears throat> and here's the thing, you know, if you were able to keep all the commandments, you know, you would need a Savior. You know, if you could, if you could keep all the commandments and never break them, you know, you could go to heaven without needing Jesus. And the Bible says in Hebrews, or Deuteronomy, keep saying Hebrews, but Deuteronomy chapter 6, look at verse uh, 22. He said, And the Lord showed signs and wonders, great and sore, upon Egypt and upon Pharaoh and upon all his households before our eyes. And he brought us out from thence that he might bring us in and give us the land which he swore unto our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is this day. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God, <coughs> as he hath commanded us. You know, if you, could keep, if, you, if, if you kept all these commandments, that would be your righteousness. You know, you can't get into heaven without being righteous. Now, you could go on your own righteousness if you were able to keep all these commandments, or you can go on Christ's righteousness. And if you would, turn over to Romans chapter 7. And what the tablets are showing us is that, <coughs> that God is holy and we're not. That when we read the commandments, we find out that we've come short of the glory of God. And that's what you see in Romans chapter 7. If you look at verse 7 where it says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not, know, I had not uh, known sin but by the law. You know, and that's a real important concept to keep in mind, especially this day and age, when you have so many people who are, you know, even so-called Christians that are very dismissive about the law. They'll say, oh, that's Old Testament. Anytime you bring up anything out of the Old Testament, Oh, well, you know, that's, that's the Old Testament. And it's almost like they have a disdain or at the very least, you know, a, a, a disregard for the Old Testament law. And it's almost like you want to ask them the same question. Is the law sin? Right. Is there something wrong with the law? The Bible says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Yeah. I mean, the law is what brings us to Christ. That is our schoolmaster that even teaches us that we even need a Savior. Right. That's why he says here, Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. He said, look, I didn't even know I was a sinner until I read the law. And that's the power of the Ten Commandments. That's the power of these tablets. And that's what, you know, that's the picture that we're seeing here. 
that when God is giving this, these, law, these commandments, he's not just giving them, hey, this is a good way to live your life. What he's showing them is, I'm holy and you're not. That's what God is showing us. That we come short of the glory of God. <clears throat> he says in verse 8, But sin taking occasion by the commandment, rotten, all, uh, rotten me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. So there was no problem without the law. Then what does he say? For I was alive without the law once. When I didn't know the law, hey, I was alive. But when sin, the commandment came, sin revived and I died. You know, the Bible says that he, he was slain. The law slew me, Paul said. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. So the problem, again, it's not the law. The law is holy. The law is just. The law is good. The problem is we come short of the law. Right. You know, we, we break, we've broken all these commandments. You know, if not, in, if not outwardly in our flesh, at least in our heart. You know, we've committed, uh, you know, adultery in our heart. We've coveted in our heart. We've blasphemed in our heart. <coughs> and, and the law, you know, condemns us. <coughs> we'll keep reading here. It says, uh, Wherefore, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Was then that which is good uh, made death unto me? God forbid. But sin that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, uh, that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. He said that sin might appear to be sin. You know, and that's the problem, I think, that a lot of people, you know, why a lot of people don't get saved because they think they're okay. They think, hey, I'm a pretty good person. But then you have to wonder, well, have you ever read this? You have, ever, have you ever tried to actually look at what God's standard is? Because it's, it's perfection. Right. It's complete uh, sinlessness. You say, well, I've lived a pretty good life. Well, the Bible says all our righteousness are as filthy rags. So go ahead and turn over to Galatians chapter 3. You know, the, what, the, what the commandment shows us is that we fall short of the glory of God. <clears throat> the Bible says in James 2, you're going to Galatians 3, it says, Whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. You know, that's a great, that's in James 2.10. That's, that's the great, that's the verse that you should take them to, the, the Jehovah Witnesses or anybody else who wants to play the, you know, faith without works is dead card. Oh, James 2. Yeah, let's turn there. Well, the Bible says if you keep you offend at one point, you're guilty of all. So good luck working your way to heaven. You know, <laughs> if, you you know if, you, if you did all the right things and then one time you messed up, pff, guilty. You, it's as if you've broken them all. It's all for naught. Look there in Galatians chapter 3, and this is just a constant, I mean, this is the message of the Bible that we have fallen short. It says in verse 10, For as many as uh, uh, are of the works of the law are under the curse. It's a curse, but it's not the law that's the problem. And so we shouldn't have this dismissive attitude about the Old Testament law or say, well, God was different back then. He was a little bit harsher. No, the law is good. It's holy, it's just, the, and it's a curse because of us. Yeah. Amen. He says, for it is written, curses everyone that continueth not in all the things which are written in the book of the law to do them. It's not that the law itself is a curse. It's that we don't, we don't do them. We don't continue in all the things that are written therein. We don't perform the law. We fall short. We break the law. That's what makes it a curse. It says, But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Of course, you know, that <coughs> we understand that, you know, uh, we're justified by faith. But the first part of that verse tells us also that the law is not a faith, but the man, uh, uh, excuse me, that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. You're not gonna, your, 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 your good deeds aren't going to get you there. No one's going to get there and say, well, I kept all the commandments. Yeah, but did you offend in one point? So we can see that's what makes the law a curse. That's what makes the law a heavy burden to be borne. And that's what God is showing us, first of all, in these tablets. You know, it's not just, hey, live your life this way. It's that we're condemned by the law. I should add, you keeps there. It's something in, in Romans 7, if you're still there. At verse 24, it says, you know, <laughs> it's pretty heavy news, right, when you start to read that. You read passages like Galatians and, and Romans 7, you say, man, is there any hope? I mean, the Bible is just condemning us. Well, what does it say in verse 24? Oh, wretched man that I am. You know, that's Paul speaking. You know, and that's, that's, where, that's where people have to get. Now, I don't know that someone has to necessarily, you know, get saved. They have to fall on their knees and declare themselves a wretch. You know, but Paul's making a point here that, uh, that we really, if we want to be honest about it, that's what we are. We are wretches. You know, we're a worm in his sight. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? I mean, I, I was thinking about that the other day as when I was traveling through the, the airport. Whenever I get around these large masses of humanity, you know, I start to think about these things. These, and just thinking about the fact that, you know, you, think about all the sin that's going on all the time. 
And every time I'm sitting on the airplane, I'm just thinking how many people are in here are just thinking sinful thoughts? Mm -hmm. How many people are on their plate or some on their way to somewhere or coming from somewhere where they did something sinful? Probably not a lot of people, but you know, we're doing necessarily wicked, terrible, horrible things. But I bet there was a lot of sin that went on over the holiday weekend. There was probably a lot of drunkenness and we moved right into covetousness. I mean, and you know, we don't often think about that, but God sees that every day. God looks down and sees the, the whole of humanity and just the wickedness. He sees a bunch of wretches. And that's, the, you know, that's kind of a heavy thought. You know? Well, is there any hope? Well, what does he say? I thank God, verse 25, uh, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So with the mind, I myself serve the law of sin, but with the flesh, the law, or excuse me, with the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. You know, it's Jesus Christ who's delivered us from all that. And now when he, God looks down and he, he sees a blood-washed, born-again believer, he doesn't see this miserable wretch. He doesn't see the sin and iniquity in our lives. You know, he sees uh, his child, you know. He sees somebody who is made righteous in Christ. But that takes, first of all, understanding that your righteousness are filthy rags. First, a person has to come to the place and understand we've fallen short of the glory of God. So that's really, you know, the importance of the tablets. That's what really what they show us there back in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 10 is that, you know, we've all come short. You know, uh, that's kind of the picture there in the first instance when, when, when Moses comes down and they're in the presence of God worshiping an idol. It's like they broke all Ten Commandments at one time and they're doing everything. And it, it's kind of that picture. Now, now God, you know, in this instance, he's saying, look, you're going to make these, these same tablets. I haven't changed. You know, I'm not going to deal differently with this group of people just because they, they already messed up. We're going to write down the same laws, the same things, and we're going to try this again. And he tells them to take it down and to put it into the ark. And the ark is a really uh, significant um, uh, concept in the Bible. And it wasn't just, you know, figurative. It was an actual thing. You know, it literally existed. And, <laughs> you know, it's a picture of all the things that are in heaven. So there's an ark in heaven as well. You know, these are all, that's what God told Moses. He said, make it according to the pattern which I showed thee in the mount. And that they are a picture of the heavenly things. You know, these are just a shadow of the things that are in heaven. So <laughs> th there is this literal ark on earth and in heaven. But what is the significance in the ark here? Well, God's telling him to take the Ten Commandments and put it in the ark. And what, is he, what does that do? Well, then he's, then he's putting a lid on it, right? It's like he's covering that up. And it, it really, what that is, the ark is a picture of God's grace. And it's a picture of many other things. But it's really a picture of God's grace. It's him saying, look, I'm not getting rid of the law, but we're going to put these commandments in here, and then we're going to cover it up. Now, what is it that they cover it up with? It's called the mercy seat. That's what, that's what that is. It's a picture of God's. So inside, you have, basically, you have God's wrath. Right. Not because, he's, because God executes vengeance on the wicked. And the, and the commandments show us that we are those people. We are the wicked. And that we sin. And that's so, th you know, the tablets, in a sense, are a picture of God's wrath. And then you have the mercy seat put on top of that. And again, you know, the, for, to further that, that picture of God's grace in the ark is the fact that, you know, that's where Christ sprinkled his blood. That he literally went into the tabernacle in heaven and sprinkled his blood once for all upon the mercy seat. So that's a great picture here that we see when God's telling him, you know, God could have told him to put it anywhere. You know, go put it under a blanket. You know, go put it, keep it with you, or, you know, put it on display. You know, there, and there wasn't that, there, that wasn't something they couldn't look upon. You know, they were to know the, the Ten Commandments. They were to write those things upon the tables of their heart. They were to have it always before their eyes. God had him put it in there for a very specific purpose, and that was to show us the grace and mercy of God, in that he covered the law, he put it under the mercy seat, under the blood of Christ. So that's a great you know, picture just starting out. We could spend a lot of time on that, but let's move along here. Uh, it says there in Deuteronomy chapter 10, we got up to verse 3, and he says in verse 4, And he wrote on the tables according to the first commandments, the Ten Commandments, which the Lord spake unto you in the mount out of the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly, and the Lord gave them unto me. And I turned myself and came down from the mount and put the tables in the ark which I made, and there they be as the Lord commanded me. And the children of Israel took their journey from Be uh, Beeroth to the children of Jacan, to uh, Mosira, and uh, there Aaron died, and there he was buried, and Eleazar, his son, ministered in the priest's office in his stead. So I want to take a minute and kind of talk about Aaron, because, you know, this is, I mean, w when Moses is recounting the journey, you know, obviously this was a significant moment in the ch their history, is when Aaron died. And of course, Aaron was, you know, kind of, was, was uh, Moses' number two, you know, was his brother, 
but he was also the one that God gave to him as Aaron's mouthpiece, you know, when he first called him. So Aaron is a significant guy. You know, he was uh, the first high, like the high priest. He, he's a, it, this is a significant moment. And we'll find this, this passage that it's referring to over in uh, Numbers chapter 20. So if you would, uh, turn over to Numbers chapter 20. We're going to look at Numbers chapter 20. And we're going to look a little bit more, because here it's just kind of mentioning it. You know, and there, Mo, and there Aaron died. But let's actually look at that instance when Aaron died. It goes into detail in Numbers chapter 20 in verse 23. It begins where the Bible reads, uh, <coughs> And the Lord spake unto Moses and to Aaron in Mount, uh, in Mount Hor by the coast of the lands of Edom, saying, Aaron shall be gathered unto his people. And that's, that's an interesting saying right there. That's how you'll often hear that when they're referring to somebody who's saved. He's, it's not, you know, and that's a good way to look at death, by the way. You know, if you're saved, it's not just, you know, we mourn because we're losing somebody that we love, but, you know, Bible puts it quite nicely here. You know, he's dying, but what is he really going on? He's being gathered unto his people. You know, he's going to heaven. You know, and that's why we should not mourn as others do who have no hope. So he's saying, look, he's going to be gathered unto his people, for he shall not enter into the land which I have given unto the children of Israel, because ye rebelled against my word at the waters of Mer uh, Meribah, Take Aaron and Eleazar his son and bring them up unto Mount Hor and strip Aaron out of his garments and put them upon Eleazar his son and Aaron shall be gathered unto his people and shall die there. And Moses did as the Lord commanded and they went up into Mount Hor in the sight of all the congregation. And Moses stripped Aaron of his garments and put them upon Eleazar his son and Aaron died in the top of the mount and Moses and, and Eleazar came down from the mount. And all the congregation saw that Aaron was dead they mourned for Aaron 30 days, even all the house of Israel. So there's a few things that we can get out of this. And one of the first things we need to take note of is the fact that, you know, Aaron was a great man of God. Aaron wasn't just some schmuck. You know, he, was, he, was a, he really was. And he kind of gets a bad rap sometimes for what he did at the base of the mount and then not justifying it. Of course, that was wrong. It was wicked. He shouldn't have done that. But, you know, that's, that shouldn't be his defining characteristic. You know, that's not, we shouldn't just like, oh yeah, Aaron, he was kind of a loser. No, Aaron was a great man of God. Aaron was mightily used of God. He was a very important person uh, in, in that ministry back then. And uh, <coughs> that's the first thing we see. I mean, look, look at there at the end, it says, and uh, Aaron was dead. They mourned for uh, Aaron 30 days, even all the house of Israel. And I don't think that was just like some ritual that they went through. I think this genuinely saddened these people, that they really genuinely felt like they lost somebody important. And they were sad for Aaron, even all the house of Israel. And it wasn't just his immediate family. So you can see the influence, the impact that Aaron had in his life. That all of Israel mourned for his loss. It wasn't just his immediate family, his friends, people that knew him. You know, uh, it was people that might never even met Aaron in person. They just kind of knew who he was. You know, never got to talk to him. But it's still, he had such a significant impact in Moses' ministry that when he went, it, you know, it, it, uh, it, 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 they felt it. And that should show us that Aaron was a great man of God. So before we just go give Aaron a black eye for his mistakes, you know, let's recognize the fact that you're talking about a man of God who's probably greater than any of us in this room. You know, so that's the truth, you know. But, and, and that's a good concept to have, too, is you know, to, to let people li live things down and let them go on to serve God. I mean, what if Moses just came down and, and at the mount the first time and saw Aaron worshiping the golden calf and said, well, that's it, you're done, buddy. I mean, we, humanly speaking, we would have said, yeah, you're perfectly just. I mean, that was a wicked sin. But what does he do? He lets him live that down and go on to serve God with his life to the point where he has, becomes a great man of God, has such an influence that when he goes, the children of Israel will feel it. And the other thing I want us to notice in this, in this passage is that Aaron was submissive to the will of God, even when it wasn't in his best interests. I mean, I don't know. Maybe he was like Paul. and He said it was, you know, had, he had a desire to depart and be with the Lord, which is far better. Maybe he was like, oh, it's time to go home. Yeah, let's get, maybe he was leading the pack up the mount. You know, like, come on, Moses, what are you waiting for? Eleazar, let's get up here. Maybe not. You know, I, in any case, he was submissive to the will of God. And humanly speaking, you know, we often say that, oh, I'm ready to go to heaven. But are we really? You know, I'm not, I don't want to die and go to heaven right away. I mean, if I went, it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. But, you know, I want to raise my kids. I want to, you know, see my family grow. I want to... I want to see my grandkids and, you know, it, Lord willing, you know, if I have the strength and, and length of days, see my great grandkids and, and, and see this church grow and see families grow. I, you know, there's a lot I want to do on earth for the Lord. I'm not, I'm not ready to go. You know, and of course, Aaron, you know, he desired to go into the promised land. 
So <laughs> when he went up that mount, I, I tend to think that, you know, he was probably, you know, not, that's not what he preferred. You know, he would rather have stuck around and see what God was going to do. He would rather continued on in this journey with, with Israel. I mean, he's got a lot invested in these people. He's, he was there through the thick and thin with Moses, you know, and, and now he's being, you know, kind of having cut short here, as it were. You know, and Moses is going to be next. But what we see is that Aaron is, is, is submissive. You don't hear anything about Aaron piping up and saying, well, wait a second, is this really necessary? Or, you know, fighting or resisting or having me drug up the mountain. He goes along with it. And really, again, showing us what a great man of God he was and an example to the rest of us. That, you know, sometimes following God, it might not, you know, be to our, you know, immediate best interest. It might not be what we want for our lives, but it's what God wants. And we have to learn to be submissive to what the Lord wants. You know, we'll read something in the Bible that goes against the grain, goes against our flesh, goes against the culture, goes against what we've been taught. And say, well, I don't know if I really agree with that. I don't know if I want to go along with that. Well, you know, I'm sure Aaron didn't want to go up the mountain and die. Right. But you know what? That's what he did. And that's a good example to us, too, that we should submit ourselves to the will of God and, and, that, you know, and allow God to exalt us in due time. So Aaron, you know, he, he was a great man of God. He was submissive to the will of God. You know, and, and it's true that he was a great leader. You know, we talked about this a little bit in previous chapters, but I'll bring it up again, is that Aaron, you know, was held accountable, that he didn't get away with what uh, he had done. And I look there in verse 24, and it says, And Aaron shall be gathered unto his people, for he shall not enter into the land which I have given unto the children of Israel, because he rebelled at my, against my word. So the, the reason why he had to die was because God wasn't going to let him go into the land. And really, when you think about it, it's kind of a merciful thing that God killed him and took him home and gathered him unto his people, rather than just letting him stand on the other side of Jordan and watch everybody else go over and say, Well, you can just live out the rest of your days over there now, Aaron. And we'll, we'll see you in heaven. You know, have fun with the Moabites and everybody else. You know, it was God was like, no, I'm going to, you know, rather than just letting you wander in the wilderness, let's just take you home. We're done with you here. And, 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 and that'll be that. But what we see primarily is that Aaron was held accountable and probably even more so because of the fact that he had that great influence that he had. And the Bible says, unto whomsoever much is given shall also much be required. You know, the more you learn, the more you grow, the more accountable you become. Uh, to God, and, and, and the less slack he's probably gonna, he's going to be cutting you. And, and when we talk about, he says that he rebelled against them there, right? In verse, uh, verse 24, he said, you rebelled against my word at the water of Meribah. What, what, and what happened there? Was it, was it, you know, Aaron didn't get up and tear pages out of the Bible or teach people heresy. He didn't, but what he, what he did is he got up, and if you recall, it's, he was supposed to speak to the rock and, and where Moses was, and then, but they ended up smiting it. And, and Aaron was, had a part in that. And so Aaron is being held accountable for this sin. And, uh, you know, and he was just kind of he was just kind of standing by, too. He was just kind of there when it happened. It wasn't even necessarily him that did it. But, you know, he didn't, of course, he didn't step in and help Moses either. So Aaron, you know, he's being held accountable for what happened. And, <clears throat> and, that, and God calls it, what did he say? God didn't say, you know, you, you did wrong. God didn't say, you know, you disappointed me. God didn't say, you know, I wish you hadn't done that. He said, ye rebelled. That's what he called it. He called it rebellion. And the Bible says that rebellion is, is a sin of witchcraft. It's a wicked sin. And that's what he calls it. He said, look, what you did was wicked because it was rebellion. And God had to be punished for it. And what is rebellion? Rebellion is doing uh, things other, uh, other than the way God has told you to do it. You know, and not just God. Rebellion is, is, is doing things other than the way any authority has told you to do something. When authority says, hey, you need to do this or, or stop doing this, and you say no, and you continue to do it your way, that makes you a rebel. You know, whether it's in the workplace, whether it's even in a local church, whether it's in a house with a family, you know, kids need to think about that. When you decide, hey, I'm going to talk back to mom and dad and tell them why they're wrong, you're a rebel, and you'll be held accountable. And God doesn't take that lightly. I mean, certainly, I'm not saying God's going to take you up a mountain and, and take you home. You know, but there's going to be some consequences. It, and God calls it rebellion, and it's wicked. And here's the thing, we all have the tendency to do it. We all have a tendency to say, well, it's, um, you know, let's do it my way. You know, or what do they know? But we need to respect authority in all the forms that it comes in our life. And here's the thing, we've all got authority in our life. I don't care who you are. You know, if you're a dad, you know, you've got an authority in God. 
If you're a member of the local church, you have, authority, you, you have an authority in the form of the Bible and, and, and church leadership. If you're in a, in a workplace situation, you know, you might be the king of your castle, but when you go out to work, you know, you have a boss. That's your authority. And, you know, we certainly wouldn't go into our workplace and give the boss an attitude and expect to keep our job or to just do things completely opposite of what they instructed us. They give us a very clear command and say, hey, this is, you need to do this. You need to quit doing this. You know, you need to fix this. You need to work on, you know, whatever it is. Then we just were like, well, I'm not going to do it. Oh, okay. Well, that's fine. You just continue. You think that's what they're going to do? They're going to, they're going to fire you. You know, if, if kids would be, you know, if they have parents worth their salt, they're not, you know, they're not going to mouth off their parents or disobey their parents and not suffer the consequences of a spanking. You know, and, and, and so it applies in all these areas. You know, if we think as God's children that we can just go live a life of sin and that, you know, God's not going to punish us, think again. God will chasten his children. He, chasten, he scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. So in all these areas, in the family, in the work, in, with God, there is an authority. And, you know, just to let you know, it's the same thing in the church house. You know, if you came in with that same attitude into the church house, there'll be consequences there too. If you just say, well, I know that this is the way, you know, church leadership said this, whether it's me or the pastor or it's just the plain teaching, the word of God, and you disregard it and just say, well, it doesn't apply to me. I'm not going to change. That's not going to fly because there has to be, somebody has to rule in the house of God. Somebody's got to hold down the fort, draw the line in the sand and say, this is the way things are going to be. Amen. So we have to keep that in mind because it's in every area of our life. Why would it be any different here? You know, in, in God's house. So... And we see that Aaron, Aaron here, you know, he was held accountable for his actions. And God, uh, you know, called what he did rebellion. So there's some good things and bad things in this passage. First of all, we see Aaron was a great man of God, right? We saw his influence. We saw that he was submissive to the will of God. We also saw that he was held, held accountable. And then we also see something else here is that, you know, Aaron, despite whatever falls, the faults he had, you know, that he managed to raise a godly child. He, and it says there in verse 28, Eliezer came down from the mount. You know, God didn't look for a whole other, you know, individual. And he's, God does that with other people. You know, you think of Eli with uh, Hophni and Phinehas, you know, in the days of Samuel when they were, you know, committing all those abominations in the tabernacle. That God told uh, uh, Eli that he would cut off his seed from the, house, uh, from, from the priesthood. God has done that, you know, in the, in the future. But in this instance, you know, it shows us that, you know, Aaron must have raised Eliezer to be a godly man. Because God, God looked down and said, okay, well, we're, we're going to have to, you know, execute this punishment on Aaron for his rebellion. But let's go ahead and, and ordain, let's bring his son into his stead. Let's have him follow in his footsteps. You know, and, and it shows us too that Eliezer, you know, that Aaron was, you know, despite his fault, was a good enough man to have raised a godly child. You know, he wasn't, uh, <laughs> he wasn't just his complete failure in life or anything like that, that he raised Eleazar despite his own flaws, that Eleazar saw enough good in his dad and the way he did things that he followed in his footsteps. And you know, what's else to notice here is that, and if you would, let's turn over to Leviticus chapter 10. Leviticus chapter 10 is that, you know, if you're, put your in El yourself in Eleazar's shoes in this instance. You know, you're going up the mount. And whether or not he knew, he, he obviously, I think they knew what was going on. I don't think God was, you know, trying to be sneaky about it at all. I think they knew they were going up to, basically, you know, Aaron's death. And they went willingly, both of them. And Eleazar went along with it. And you know what? You never hear anything from Eleazar. And Eleazar, you know, he didn't get bitter at God for what had happened. And that's something to keep in mind. That Eleazar wasn't mad at God for taking his dad home sooner than he would have liked. You know, I'm sure Eleazar kind of liked having Pa around. You know, he probably, you know, enjoyed Aaron. And that company, they had that relationship of, as a father and son. And, God, and he goes up in the mount and God takes him home, kills him. And you don't hear anything from Eleazar. Eleazar doesn't get bitter. He doesn't, you know, shake his fist at God. He doesn't get angry with God. Quite the opposite. He takes the garments on. He goes down and he continues to work for God. He goes, continues to serve God in a, in a, in a great capacity. But here's the thing. Where did Eleazar learn that? He learned that from Aaron. If you remember that in, in uh, Leviticus chapter 10. Look at verse 1. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron. So Eleazar wasn't the only son that Aaron had. You also have these guys. Nadab and Abihu. 
Well, why didn't they get to take uh, <laughs> the position? Well, let's read on. We'll find out. He said, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took, uh, took of either of them uh, the, his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. So these guys, <coughs> you know, they, they do this, uh, this sin. They, they do something they're not supposed to do. Again, they do things their own way, right? Kind of like Aaron did a little bit. You know, hey, let's, let's, let's speak to the rock. Let's not, you know, let's strike the rock and not speak to the, you know, just in the heat of the moment. These guys were a little bit more deliberate in what they did. Oh, you know, well, you know, God told us exactly what kind of he wants in that incense and that we weren't supposed to make any other. And that we shouldn't offer some strange offering before the Lord. They'd already been warned of all this and they do it anyway. So they're a little bit more willing in their sin. You know, and I've heard some people and I really don't have the time. I don't know if I should, you know, breach the subject, but... I've heard it suggested that they might have even been drunk when they did this, and there's actually some good teaching behind that that they were, you know, the, under the influence, you know. And and again, I, I don't like to just throw things out there, so maybe I'm gonna, now that I've said that, I'm probably gonna have to come back and, and clarify that in another sermon. But um, there's I've heard that preached, and I've heard that you know argument made, and, and I think it holds some water. So in any case, drunk or not, they did this right, and God slays them. It says, uh, the fire from the Lord came out and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Now look at verse 3. Then Moses said unto Aaron, This is that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified, and them that come nigh me, and be glorified, all, and, and before all the people will I be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. So, I mean, think about Aaron. He got <laughs> two of his sons just taken out like that. And what was, their, what was their sin? They offered the wrong kind of incense? No, humanly speaking, a person could probably say, Well, what's the big deal? They were trying to do a good thing. In their mind, they were thinking, oh, let's go make an offering before the Lord. Yeah, but you didn't do it God's way. You did the wrong thing. Right. And God's holy and God's just and God's righteous and God wants things done a certain way. And sometimes, you know, again, God has to make examples of people, especially if they have influence over others. Especially if they're in a position where other people are looking to them. Like these guys, like Nadab and Abihu. They're the Levites. They're the sons of Aaron. They are influential. They're, they have the censors to even be able to go and offer this. They're obviously in a position where they could even do this. People know who they are. And God lets them slide. God says, don't offer strange fire before me. And then they go and offer strange fire. And then he goes, well, you know, I guess I'll let it slide. You know, we can't make these little exceptions in life. If, if there's a rule, it's there for a reason. And it has, you know, because here's, a lot of the times it's not just because you got to hold a line on a rule because it, if you start, if you give a little bit of room, then you have to give a little bit more, and then you have to get a little bit more. And he says, "Well, you know, Eleazar, you know, and and, and, uh, and uh, what's his name? I'm forgetting already. It's right here. I just read it. Yeah. <laughs> Abihu, right? Nadab and Abihu. I kept saying Eleazar. Nadab and Abihu. You know, God says, "Well, I know. You know, you guys should have. You should have offered this. You know, you, you offered the strangest, and you said done that. But I'm gonna let it slide. You know, the, well, what what comes next?" What, 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 now somebody else, oh, Nadab and Abihu got away with that. Well, I wonder what I could get away with. Maybe I'll push it a little bit further. You know, maybe, maybe someone who's not a Levite will say, well, no, I feel like maybe I could go do that. Offer whatever I want. So it's a slippery slope is what happens. And that's why God has to draw a hard line with people and say, no exceptions. And if you violate my law, there's going to be consequences. And he makes examples out of people, especially when they're in places of influence, such as Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, Moses, so on and so forth. But what we see in this passage, again, is that when God executes his, his vengeance and his righteousness on these people, is Aaron held his peace. Aaron understood who God was. Aaron had a closeness with God and said, I understand this is the way God is. This is the way it has to be. And he didn't get mad. He didn't, you know, he didn't, he didn't revile God. You know, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't, uh, blame God or curse God. He didn't get bitter in his spirit. And that attitude, you know, I believe Eleazar saw that. And he probably saw that even be, uh, beyond just this particular instance. I mean, yeah, it's pretty easy to not get bitter right then and there. <laughs> you know, when, when, when fire just devoured your, your kids. And who knows, if I say something, it might come after me next. But there was, there was a time span that, w that went on to when Aaron died, and all I believe that all that time, Eliezer probably never heard Aaron one time say, mutter and curse God under his breath for this. That Aaron was right in his heart, that he had a right heart about this all the days of his life. And that had an influence in Eliezer to where when the same thing, in a similar thing, happened to his dad, he, doesn't, he has the same reaction. 
when his dad, his life is cut short and he's gathered unto his people, you don't see Eleazar uh, getting mad because he saw the example of his father. And again, it's just showing us what a godly man Aaron was, what a great man he was, that he, uh, he raised a godly child in Eleazar, a godly son to come in his stead. And it wasn't easy. You know, we say that like it's an, like it's an easy thing to do. I mean, well, Aaron went through some things. Aaron had to suffer some, some, some hard blows in life. I mean, to see your kids taken out like that, that that's not easy. I mean, I can't imagine, I mean, we, we as parents, that's like, that's, that's a fate worse than death for many of us, to think of something terrible happening to our kids, death, dying early. No one wants to say that. Well, Aaron saw it twice in the same day, and he never got bitter and never cursed God, and it, it passed on to his son. So that's a great example, I think, of Aaron. You know, we look at his death. You know, that the, in, in the Deuteronomy, it's just kind of mentioned, but there's a lot there. There's a lot to unpack with Aaron and his death, and more importantly, in his life. But let's move on here for sake of time. Let's go to verse, uh, back to Deuteronomy chapter 10. Deuteronomy chapter 10. We'll pick it back up here in verse 12. Or we leave off, actually. <coughs> Uh, yeah, verse. let's pick it up in a verse, uh, where were we? I think we're at, four. at four? Is that all the further we got? No, we got past four. Let's just pick it up in five. And I turned my safe self and came down from the mount, which the tables in the ark, which I had made, thereby uh, as the Lord had commanded. And we got, yeah, Aaron died, verse six, and then verse seven. From thence we journeyed to uh, Gogoda, and from uh, Gogoda uh, to Jobath, a land of rivers of waters, at that time, the Lord separated the tribe of Levi to bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord, to minister unto him, to bless in, uh, and to bless in his name unto this day. Wherefore, Levi hath no part nor inheritance with his brethren. The Lord is his, is his inheritance, as the Lord hath, uh, thy God promised him. And I stayed in the mount according to the first time, forty days and forty nights. And the Lord, the Lord hearkened unto me at that time, and the Lord would not destroy thee. So if you remember, Moses went up, and God was ready to, we talked about this just recently in one of the previous chapters, God was ready to wipe out Israel. And Moses, the influence that he had, he was able even to change God's mind. He went up there and, and pleaded on their behalf. When God had already offered him the position, said, hey, I'll just start over with you. And then just showed me, I, I'm re-preaching it, but that's such an amazing thing to me every time I think about it. That Moses turned that down and said, no, God, let's, you know, for your name's sake, let's, let's keep working with these people. That's amazing. Verse 11, And the Lord said unto me, Arise, take thy journey before the, the people, that they may go in and possess the land where I, uh, which I swear unto them, uh, their fathers, to give unto them. And now, Israel, what doth the Lord require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God and to walk in all his ways and to love him and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes which I command thee this day for thy good. And good, and you know, I'm going to be saying this a lot as we go through this book. Because God lays down a lot of law in, in, in the Old Testament. A lot of do's and don'ts. And you always have to remember that there in verse 19. For thy good. You know, the preacher, the Bible. Why has the preacher got to get up and, and ruin my good time? Right. For thy good. Right. You know, why, does, why did Brother Jake have to come down here and, and remind us all about not drinking alcohol and how to ruin our life? Amen. And we're, you know, New, Year's, New Year's is right around the corner. It's the holiday season. Right? He's just trying to ruin my fun. No, it's for your good. Amen. So you don't end up you know, a casualty in life. And that's just you know, a commercial announcement. That's just a little... That was for free, as they say. <laughs> so I want to focus in there in verse 12, though. There's this interesting, what I call this progression of obedience. There's like this multifaceted concept of obedience here. He says there in verse 12, And now, Israel, what did the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God to walk in all his ways and to love him and to serve him. So <laughs> there's this progression where you go from fearing the Lord unto serving the Lord with all thy heart and soul. Now, I don't think everybody gets this whole package all at once. I don't think we as Christians in our Christian life, you know, we just get all, we're, we go from just, you know, we're, you know, we get saved and we're just, we just love God we're, with everything in our spirit and we're, you know, nothing's going to stop us from serving him. People have to grow to that place. And that's why we have to be patient with people and let them grow into, these, in these, into this place <laughs> over time. But it starts with fear. Amen. That's the place that it starts with. And that's why it's good to come to, the, to come to church and hear preaching. And that's why it's important as preachers to preach the whole counsel of God, to put the fear of God in people. 
Because that is the foundation of our Christian life. That's what's going to get you to the place where you're going to serve God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. It starts with fear. And, and I'm not talking about, you know, just a godly reverence for God. I'm saying terror, trembling before God, being afraid of what God will do to you. That's a good thing to have in your life, to be afraid of God. It's the fear here that is the basis. <clears throat> you know, fearing that, you know, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, it says in Proverbs. Fear is the foundation. Notice that before walking, before all these things, it says, fear the Lord thy God, right? And then he moves on, you know, to the walk. You know, we, why do we walk in God's ways? Why do we keep his commandments? Why do we begin to walk down the path that he's, he's laid out before us? Out of fear. Because we don't want to experience the chastening hand of God. We don't, when we wander out of the way, God's not just going to let, it, God's not just going to let his child wander out of the way. Would any of us do that to our children? You know, if my little boy, and he's, he's finding that age where he can reach up and grab the handle, and his mom's gone to do the laundry, and he, he's done this, opens the door, and just, I'm going to go check out, you know, the apartment complex. Well, we, oh, well, just go right ahead. You little three-year-old, little four-year-old, you know, tell us what you find. You know, take some breadcrumbs with you so you can get your way back. You know, no, if we're going to close the door, bring him inside, we're going to have, we're going to have a little, we're going to have some sweet fellowship, as I like to call it. <laughs> Right? There's going to be some instruction that takes place. And cause why? Because I want him to be afraid right. of, of us, you know, of disobeying us. It's the same way with God. You know, God chastens every son when we receive it. There is, and if we be without chastisement, then we are bastards. You know, if you can live your life in sin and open sin, and I'm not saying like you mess up and all of a sudden God's going to rain down. I'm, you know, there is grace and mercy. We should, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But if you can just willingly go against the will of God to say, I know God disapproves of this. I know God doesn't want me to do this. And I'm going to do it. I'm going to keep doing it. You turn to a stiff-necked person and God doesn't cloud up on rain on you. I mean, I would wonder about my salvation. Right. You know, I would wonder, because the Bible says, there, you know, except you be with, you know, there, he chasteneth every son whom he receiveth. And, and, and it's in Hebrews 12. Uh, there's not a son whom he chasteneth not. You know, you know, except you be, except you be bastards and not sons. What it means to be a bastard? To be fatherless. He's saying, look, if you can go through your Christian life and never experience the chasing hand of God, are you even a Christian? Are you even saved? <laughs> and then that should cause us to fear. That's why fear is the basis of this whole thing. We fear the Lord. It's the beginning of wisdom, the Bible says. That says that over and over. Read the book of Proverbs. And look how many times that phrase comes up. The fear of the Lord. 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 It's all throughout Scripture. God emphasizes it. So the fear of chastening is what causes us to walk with the Lord. Uh, let's go back to Deuteronomy. I know we're, we're kind of running out of time. Let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter 5 real quick. We're right there. Deuteronomy chapter 5, look at verse uh, 32. It says, uh, you, shall observe, therefore, to do, you shall observe to do therefore as the Lord God hath commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right hand nor to the left. You shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God hath commanded you, that you may live, and you may be well with you. Again, it's for your own good. And that you may prolong your days in the land which you possess. God's saying, look, you're going to obey me. Don't turn to the left. Don't turn to the right. Follow me. That it, for your own good, so that I don't have to chasten you, so that I don't have to cloud up and rain on you. So we see, you know, we start out with fear. You know, we don't want the chase in the hand of God. We say, okay, I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to walk after God. I'm going to keep his commandments. And what you find is when you start to walk with God is that you start to love God. You know, obeying God out of fear is a great place to start, but that should not be where you end up. That should not be, that is not a static position in life. That should not be, uh, you know, there's, it, it should change. It should come a place where you move from I obey out of fear be, to obeying out of love. And that happens as you walk with God. That's why it's fear the Lord thy God, walk with him, and then you will love him. And it's in that order for a reason. I, I believe God puts these things in an order for a reason. And we have to take the time to, to meditate upon these things and think about them and to, and to apply it. He says, walk in all his ways and to love him. You know, when you start to walk with God, you start to realize this really is for my own good. And you start to see the blessings of God. And you start to look back on your life as you've walked with him and see all the good things that he's done for you along the way. And it causes you to love him. And now you've gone from a place, I'm going to serve God out of fear because I'm afraid of what's going to happen. And now you've walked with God and you've come to a place where you say, I'm going to continue to serve God because I love Him and I see everything that He's done for me as I've walked with Him. So you move from this place in your life from, you know, from, from serving out of fear 
to serving out of love. You have to, and it, 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 it comes as you walk out of obedience. The Bible says, can two walk together except they be agreed? We come to start to agree with God. You know, this is the right way of where I should walk. This, I see why God yeah, right. tells us to do this and not to do that. This makes sense. We, I, you begin to agree with God as you walk with him. If you love me, Jesus said, keep my commandments. When we get to the place in our life where now we're going to keep commandments because we love him, not just because we're afraid of him. The Bible says that perfect love casteth out fear. You know, when, you're, when, you're, when you love God, when that is complete, when it's perfect, there's no need for fear anymore. I mean, it's still there. We still understand that God is great and mighty and terrible and we understand what would happen if we went off the rails. But we're not, that we're not, that's not what motivates us to stay right with God. Now we do it because we actually love him. Because we want to please him. Because <laughs> here's the thing. Our love of God is proportionate to our obedience. Our love of God is proportionate to our, our obedience. You want to know how much you can tell if you love God? How obedient are you to him? People say, oh, I love God. Okay, really? How obedient are you? How much do you obey God? That will tell you how much you love God. <laughs> so we see that through fear we walk. By walking we come to, to know and love God. And in loving him, we begin to serve him with sincerity, out of a loving heart. And we serve him with all our soul and with all our heart, with all our might, and with all our days. I believe a person can get to life. I mean, it's always possible, don't get me wrong, but people mature to a point where there's just no turning back. It's like I, I, they've got so much invested, they've seen the goodness of God so much, to just cast, throw it all away would be nonsense. And that, but that doesn't happen overnight. People grow to that place as their walk with God. And again, and I've said it several times tonight, that's why we have to be patient with people. Because when are people going to quit on God early on in their Christian life? That you, a year in, two years in, three years in, that's just the beginning. That's just the start. You don't measure the, the Christian life in years. You measure it in decades. And when people are first starting out, it's, you know, you got to be patient with them because that's when they're most likely to just quit. That's when they had the least invested in the Christian life. That's when the world is still fresh in their mind. That's when you know, it'd be still real easy to just go back to all those things. And we've got to give them time. Let them learn to fear the Lord. Let them learn to walk with God. Let them to learn to love God as they, over time as they begin to see how good God is. Now I'm, saying, I'm not saying, no, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying you can't love God from day one. I believe everyone in this room loves God. They want to serve God. But is that what's always going to keep us in line? You know, that's going to keep us from committing certain sins. Not, at, not always at first. A lot of times in our early on in our Christian life, the only thing that's keeping us from going off the rails is because we're afraid of what God will do. We want to do it. We want to go do that. We're just afraid. My little boy wants to go out and explore the parking lot, but he's afraid of what Dad's going to do. And now, you know, he's going to get to the point where he's older, he's grown, he could throw that door open and be out there, and he could outrun the old man. Right? He probably could do that already. Just don't let him know that. Right? But he's not going to. He's going to stay in because he loves me. Because he'd rather spend time with me than go kick rocks in the parking lot. Does that make sense? That an illustration was off the, off the cuff, so hopefully that made sense. But anyway, that's what a great... I read that verse today, and I just thought, man, that's a great picture of the Christian life. You start out with fear, you walk, you learn to love, and then it's just with everything you got, eventually. <coughs> But let's go ahead and move on here. Let's look at verse 18 and 19. We'll wrap this up. It's getting late. It says in uh, chapter 18, we'll, we'll pick it up in verse 14. Behold, the heavens and the heaven of heavens is the Lord's thy God, the earth also with all that therein is. There's a lot there too, the heavens of heavens. So, you know, we could talk about that. You know, the cosmology or the layout of, of creation. You know, you have the heavens, which is around the earth you know, within the ozone layer, and then you have the stars, and then, and then beyond that. You know, there's, there's the heavens and the heavens of heavens, you know, and, he, you know, God, where God's throne is somewhere beyond the heavens of the heavens. So, I don't know if I should have even mentioned that, <laughs> but that's an interesting verse. The heavens of heavens, right? They're all gods. The Lord, uh, is the Lord's thy God. Keep that in mind, you know. If you're living in Tucson, you get to see a little bit more of the stars than you do up in Phoenix. You know, I was just talking to somebody about this recently that, you know, how interesting it is that man throughout all of, his, all of his history has been just fascinated with cosmology, with the stars, with the study of the night sky. You know, all the ancient civilizations, people throughout, cent you know, just thousands of years all had their constellations. They've all looked up at the night sky and just wondered at it. You know why? Because they could probably, because that's when they could see it. <laughs> we can't see it for what it is here in, you know, in Phoenix. In Tucson, we're a little bit better because we have the observatories, 
There's restriction on the street lamps here. They are allowed to only have so many street lamps in the streets for the observatory's sake. And, uh, you know, and, and another thing, you know, if you get out, but we got to like get out in the, you know, into the wilderness now. We got to get away from the light pollution to even see the stars. You know, and, I, and I'm kind of going off on a tangent here, but I mean, that when I, before I got saved, that was one of the things that I believe God used in my life to bring me to a saving knowledge of Christ was the stars themselves. Because uh, I was living in the Caribbean with my dad for a while, and down there there's very little light pollution. I could see all these constellations, and I would just stand outside at night and just dumbfounded by the majesty of the stars. And it just caused me to realize that there is something much bigger than me in life, and that I'm a very small person. And it's just, it's just uh, to even fathom the cosmos sometimes, it's, it's, it's amazing. And what's, but what's the Bible saying here? That it's the Lord's. That he knows every star by name, the Bible says. You know what I love about Genesis when it, 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 where it says he and he made the stars also. They're like he's like hey, you know he made the sun you know he made the sun he made the earth he made all this and he made the stars also. Just that that's it and then he just moves on and can you and then he, what, what but what is he then what does the Bible focus on? Man he goes on to talk about man his relationship with man. Oh and he made the stars also. You know that's just the majesty and the greatness of God. You know we. We look at the, the stars and you have to under, remember that, you know, they're the Lord's. The heaven of heaven, that's what, that's, what God, that's what Moses is trying to drive in right here. Behold, the heavens and the heavens of heaven is the Lord's thy God, the earth also, also and all that therein is. You know, there's nothing you're, you're going to be, you know, even if you could, you know, okay, the earth is the Lord, everything that's there, well, let me go to the moon. Well, that's his too. Well, let me go over to Mars. Eh, that's mine. You know, well, let me get out of the galaxy. Mine too. There's nothing you're going to be able to go stake a claim on that is God's. That isn't God's. And what does he say? Only the Lord hath delight in thy fathers uh, to love them and to choose their seed after them, even you above all people as it is this day. Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no more stiff-necked. He's saying, look, consider who your God is and don't be stiff-necked. He's trying to get them to understand how great God is so that they'll obey him and, and, and love him. And that's the same way in our own life. You know, if we stop and just, you know, go out and... and you know, and, and, and ponder the greatness of God that might cause us to be a little bit more appreciative of who that we're saved and, that, and, and desire to serve him. <clears throat> he doth execute judgment of the fatherless and widow and love at the stranger in giving him food and raiment. Love ye therefore the stranger, for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. This is God's foreign, uh, this is, now I want to say foreign policy, this is God's immigration policy right here. Okay? And we're in Tucson, so this has a little bit of you know, this has some, this meat, some meat on the bone, right? You know, even in Phoenix, because what do we have? We have a lot of immigrants. We have a lot of illegal immigrants. Now, they're only illegal because the United States government has declared them so. But, and, you know, you won't see that in the Bible. You won't see a, a border patrol, you know, checkpoint and, 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 a, and a visa program. And, you know, these imaginary lines that have to be protected. What God has open borders. Now, I'm not saying God doesn't have national sovereignty. Because, oh, God was all about, Israel. you know, he wanted the nations divided. Yeah, they did. And he also had free travel in those nations. He allowed people to come and go freely as they pleased. You know, and this, this is something that, you know, is a little bit striking close to home for me because I just did some traveling. And I remember, you know, and, and, and if, let me just, let me just uh, plug the TSA for a minute. Let's, all right, this, this message was brought to you by the TSA, if you can believe that. But, uh, Get the pre-check. Who here has pre-check for TSA? Nobody. I mean, see, you were in the same boat I was up until this last trip. I got it before this last trip. And it was great. I walked right up. Who, who's traveled where you have to, you know, take, take, the, take everything out of the bag, take the toothpaste out, take the laptop out, take your belt off, take your shoes off, take everything out of your pockets, and stand there, go through the naked body scanner, or have some, some stranger grope you, yeah. right? That's where we're at. Well, I'll tell you what, if you get the TSA pre-check, you know, you spend about 70 bucks, you know, you get the five-year program, you're, it's good for five years, you do a background check, you have to go down to the airport and have an interview, it's like a couple hours of your time, it's so worth it, because you just, I walked up in Phoenix, I was like, do I have to take my laptop out? Nope, not take my belt off? Nope, you have to take your shoes off? Nope, just walk through this, it was like that. You know what it was? It was the, it was the way, it, it takes it back to the way it was before the Patriot Act, it, before the TSA, right? It's like the old school, the way it used to be. You, know, you just have to empty your pockets and walk through. The, the way it used to be, the good old days. So <laughs> I don't know why I'm going off on this, but uh, oh yeah, God's, uh, God's uh, uh, immigration policy. 
you know, man, we could, boy, that would be nice if that's what we had, right? Uh, you know, and we say, well, what about the terrorists? You know, you know the TSA hasn't busted one terrorist in their entire existence? It's never happened. And they've failed. People have gotten through those things all the time. The people go in to test that system, and they get through all the time. It's a joke. Anyway, <coughs> I'm going off. But this is God's, you know, he says, love ye therefore the stranger. Embrace him. Allow him to come in. Right. You know, don't, don't build a wall on the border. We're going to build a wall. It's going to be a great wall. It's going to be a great wall. I know all the great walls. You know, they're going to pay for it. It's going to be wonderful. You know, that's not God's policy. God doesn't say build a great wall. It's going to be a big wall, a little door, you know. So I haven't seen too many Trump impressions. So I'm working on it. But is that God's policy? Build a wall? Keep everybody out? No. And people say, oh, national sovereignty. God didn't say don't have borders. God didn't say don't have, we're the nation of Israel. This is that nation. This is that. God didn't say that. God's against the one world you know, government and all that, you know. But here's the thing. God allows free travel. God's allowed people, hey, you want to be a citizen of Israel? You just go there and you convert. And you, bam, you're a citizen. But God didn't say if they come to your land and, and they don't convert, treat them poorly. Treat them like second-class citizens. And, and uh, you know, look down on them and, 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 dis, and you know, you disparage them because they're not, you know, they didn't go and get, you know, what, what is the process that they, you have to go through nationalized or whatever it is. You know, you have to go through that whole process to become a citizen. So what? Uh, it, it's crazy. God says love them. You know, that should be our attitude. Because here's the thing, you know, anybody back then could become an Israelite. It wasn't just about being born in the land or being, a, uh, you know, having a bloodline. You know, there's, there's a multitude of examples that we can think of. Here's some popular ones. Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite. The Kenizzite. Uh, Rahab the harlot, who's in the lineage of Christ, mentioned in Matthew. Right? She was, remember, in Jericho? That was not an Israelite. And she's, she is in the bloodline of Christ, his, his lineage. How about, you know, say so that's Old Testament. Okay, well, how about one of the 12 disciples? Simon the Canaanite. Yeah, right. You know, he, he's, a, he's a foreigner. And God loved him and brought him into his fold and, and taught him, made him one of the 12 disciples. Because God says, hey, love the stranger. There's no closed borders in God's law. Maybe I'm mistaken. Maybe someone can show me and I'm open to being corrected. I have never read it. I've never seen it where God says, set up a checkpoint, set up a border. Don't let them pass through unless they, you know, they're only allowed in for so long and then they got to go. They can have a visa. You know, it's open. It's open borders. And, uh, you know, that, that, would, that would benefit us a great deal. You say, well, and here's the thing. You say, well, you're pro-illegal immigration. No, I'm not. I'm not. I believe people, if they want to live here, they should assimilate. They should become citizens. They should learn to speak English. And, you know, but what I'm not for is building walls. You know, and you say, why are you going off this? Because I have no, because this is the mentality that's out there in this Fox News you know, conservative world where they would rather shoot people trying to come across the border than, than love them. You say, that's crazy. I've heard people say that. Remember when that whole thing about a year and a half, two years ago with... Uh, the, the whole, this alleged huge group of immigrants that were going to come up from Honduras yeah. and cross the border. Who heard about that? Yeah. You know, I heard about it because my boss at back then, not the boss I have now, that's for sure, <laughs> but the boss I had back then in my previous job, you know, he was this Fox New conservative and he just ate that stuff up and he was regurgitating this at work one day. These Hondurans are coming up, you know, they're going to cross our border. And these were his words. I think they should just put the army on there and just, when they just open fire when they see him coming. Wow. And I just shook my head and I just had to walk away. I thought, really, you think they should just open fire on, you know, women, children? Well, maybe there's no women children. Okay, sons, husbands, brothers. Usually they just slay them because they're trying to cross a border. Trying to get into a country that, you know, is probably in a large part responsible for why things are so bad in their part of the world. <laughs> so that, it's, it's, that's why you're kind of going off on it because, you know, it's infuriating. You know, it's, it's, it's stupid to have this policy. I'm not for illegal immigration. You want, to prob you want to solve the problem of illegal immigration? Stop giving away free stuff. Yep. Stop, you know, stop uh, you know, ruining the agriculture down in those countries. Stop you know, subsidizing everything. And you know, maybe, maybe America could get off drugs and the cartels would dry up. Right. And Mexico would be you know, a, a safe place to live once again. You know, so who can blame people from wanting to escape a drug war that we're responsible for in large part? I mean, who can blame them? Right. You, know, you want to fix the immigration problem Get off drugs, quit giving away free stuff, and people will stay there. Mexico is a nice place from what I've heard. Yeah. There's some beautiful parts of Mexico. I mean, isn't that where everyone wants to go on vacation? Cancun and right. I don't know where all the other favorite spots. That's the one I know because in Michigan, that's where everybody went. Cancun, right? Oh, wow. 
Baja. You know, there's all these beautiful places in Mexico. I mean, it's on. It's got ocean on both sides. I mean, you know, South America, all these places. So God says, "Look, love the stranger. You know, don't look down on him. Don't disparage him. You know, love him, embrace him. You know, allow him to come come into your country." Well, they don't pay taxes. That's stupid. I know I'm getting. I'm going off. That's a dumb statement to say they don't pay taxes. Think about it. Of course they. Maybe they have a fake identity. I'm not for that. I'm not supporting them. They shouldn't do it. It's wrong. You know, maybe they're not paying some kind of income tax, although they probably are. But they're, when they buy gas, they're paying tax. When they buy food, they're paying taxes. When they buy anything, they're paying taxes. To say they don't pay taxes is stupid. They do pay taxes, just like anybody else. But anyway, I'm going off. It's, going, it's getting late. But this is God's law. You know, God's law is perfect. And, you know, I, and I'm sorry, you can make all the, the logical arguments you want, but... There is no closed border policy in the Bible. Now, God does say, you know, obviously we defend from invading forces. You know, we're not going to just let some army march over us, but we're talking about the stranger. We're talking about somebody who's wandering, somebody who's trying to look, you know, for greener pastures. So he says there, um, for the Lord your God, in verse 17, is God of gods, a Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty and a terrible, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. You know, God, you can't change God's foreign policy or God's immigration policy by, you know, go bribing some senator. You know, he's greater than that. He doesn't take reward. He doth execute judgment of the fatherless and the widow and loveth the stranger in giving him food and raiment. Love ye therefore the stranger. For ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God. Him shalt thou serve and to him shalt thou cleave and swear by his name. He is thy praise and he is thy God. He hath done for these these great and terrible things which thy eyes have seen. Now it says, you know, he is thy praise. And, you know, that we should be, if we're not, if we find ourselves not praising God, maybe we should focus on the latter half of that verse. Maybe if praise isn't something that we find ourselves doing very often, well, you know, you should consider that he hath done for the great and terrible things. I think sometimes, you know, if we just meditate on all the great things God has done for us in salvation, praise would probably become a little bit more natural for us. Let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer.